Hello and welcome to day two of physical science. Um, today we're really going to get into some physics. Um, this isn't a, as I said a physics class. This is physical science. There's going to be a lot of chemistry at the end, but today we'll get really getting to the beginning of the science with physics. And the general idea is we're going to talk about motion in this chapter, um, how we define it, and equations we can link to it. So. Um, I think I'm just going to jump right in. In general, if you're going to talk about how something is moving, before you can talk about how something is moving, you're going to need to talk about where a thing is. So before we can talk about motion, let's talk about position. Position is just a way to define the location of something. Oops, didn't mean to do that yet. Um, and to define the position of something, you need two things. The first is you have to have a zero point. If you think about when you measure the length of something, right? And I had a tape measure right here, but there it is. If I want to measure the length of something, I have to have one end of this tape measure at a spot that although like I can't say I can't say the length of something without saying where we're started from. Likewise, you want to say position. You need a place to measure from. It's all well and good to say, you know, Dow High is in the middle of the Catskills, but it's not a very descriptive thing on an actual map. If I want to say the distance between Oneonta to Delhi, I can define it from Delhi or Oneonta, depending on which way I'm going, but I can't just do it without some sort of place I'm measuring from. You must always have a zero point. Also, in measure position, you have to have a direction. Um, going back to the Oneonta Delhi idea, if I tell you that Oneonta is 20 miles from Delhi, and that's all I tell you, and you didn't know any better, that would give a circle of regions that Oneonta could be. It wouldn't necessarily be able to find it real quick. You'd have to know that it is north, northeast. Um, but without that knowledge, you'd just be like, oh, it's somewhere in this circle around it. And so when you define position, you must always have a spot that you measure from, normally the zero point, and also what direction it is in. Now, we're going to do mostly one dimensional motion in this class. And so the direction would normally say it's with the arrow or it's against it. It's in the positive direction or it's in the opposite in the negative direction. So we'll come back to those positive and negatives in a tiny bit. Um, you should normally be measuring your position in needles. But here's the thing, our goal here is to talk now about position, but motion. And so now if we have a position to find, we can define what is called displacement. Uh, so I'm going to mute whoever you are, just because it's not a background noise. But if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Displacement is how we're going to talk about change in position. And displacement is kind of interesting. Displacement is just where you ended up minus where you started doesn't matter how you got there. Uh, this picture from an old textbook shows that someone goes from their hometown to the state university, possibly passing through Podunk. Yeah, I love it. If you take, if someone goes and follows this path and goes, oh, that's not what I wanted, and goes from here, follows this path like that, on this map, it says they traveled 90 miles, 40 plus 50. But that's not their displacement. That's the distance they traveled. Displacement is just where they ended up minus where they started. Their displacement would simply be the distance between here. Oops, that was a horrible line. Here and here in a straight line. But displacement is just your final position minus your initial. And so if someone traveled the path I did in red, and someone else traveled this path in green, even though they traveled different distances, they'd have the same displacement. Now, this is nice because it's going to make solving things easier. If you want to do the distance between Oneonta and Delhi, continuing with that example, the distance you travel from Oneonta to Delhi is a little complicated because you go up and over hills and around pieces and, and slip around to the side. And it's just a very, very complicated process if you get the whole distance, other than the fact your call can measure it exactly. But we could, 
if we do displacement, we just look at a map from above and say you started here, you ended there, this is everything in between. Now, the nice thing is it seems like just distance and not displacement would be the important part. But for physics, we always are going to work, or usually going to work, we'll talk about when we don't, with displacement. And this makes life easy. You don't care how you go from point A to point B, just that you do. Any questions there? So, to give it to you in example form. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, I still have my highlight selected. So let's say I got the ship. It goes from point X1 to point X2. Its displacement is just its final position minus initial position. It's just X2 minus X1. That's all the displacement is. If it does this and goes on this crazy path, oops, where it goes all over the place and ends at X2, its displacement is still the same. It doesn't matter. Also of note, if it starts at X1, moves around and returns to X1, that's a displacement of zero. That if it starts and returns at the same spot, it might have moved some distance, but it has no displacement. What this means, which I said before, is that displacement and distance isn't the same. If I take a ball and do do do. Oh, shit. That did not do what I wanted it to do. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, damn it. I had it all set up, but no, I had to go mess it up. OK. If I take a ball and throw it up and catch it at the same height, right? I could talk about the distance it travels. The distance the ball travels is going to be basically twice the height because it goes up some height and then back down. That would be the distance it travels. But the displacement would be zero because it started and stopped at the same point. We make sense so far? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Now, before I can get further, and I'm going to in a second, but I got to do a quick aside and talk about vectors and scalars. Uh, vectors and scalars come up a lot in physics. Vector quantities are something that need both size and direction. The general idea with a vector is that if you talk about something's position or displacement, it's not good enough to just say how far it went. You need to know which way. You know, if I tell you I'm going to go. 100 miles, it's going to matter which direction I'm going 100 miles. If I go straight up, it's going to be kind of interesting what happens to me. I go straight down, it got really complicated. It's going to make a difference. A vector quantity is anything that must include direction. Now, for the most part, we're going to do one dimensional. And what that means is if I look at a traditional, uh, yeah, if I look at a traditional three dimensional axis, which why won't you zoom out? Here we go. Traditional three-dimensional axes. When we talk about position, we have to talk about where they are relative to x and y. But if we only deal with one-dimensional, we'll just say that things can go in what positive or negative direction. Positive direction means they're going with the direction with it. Negative direction when they're going against. And so we are normally when we talk about vectors, just going to talk about things being positive or negative. Positive with our axes, negative without. Traditionally, we say up, or sorry, we say to the right is the positive direction, and up is the positive direction. That's the traditional way to do it. That means anything pointing to the right, I'm going to say is positive. Anything pointing up, I'm going to say is positive. But likewise, anything pointing down or to the left, I'm going to say is negative. A scalar, on the other hand, does not include direction. Scalars only have magnitude. Take, for example, weight. If I tell you something has a mass of 180 kilograms, there's no direction involved. It's not 180 kilograms going up. It's not 180 kilograms moving to the right. It's just 180 kilograms. And so scalars only have magnitude and no direction. 
Because of this, scalars are always positive, with a few exceptions that I'll cover much later on different days. Um, because you know you you don't go in the negative direction. You don't have negative mass and whatnot, unless you're getting into anti metal, but that's way beyond our pay grade here. Now, so far, I've only talked about two things, position and displacement. Position and displacement are vectors. Now, when you label either one, you have to say what direction it's in. Oop, I thought there was more there, um, but there's not. And so, yeah, position and displacement are vectors. We always include the direction. But once again, you don't normally bother writing to the right or to the left or to the up or to the down. We'll just assume anything to the right is positive, anything to the left is negative. Anything up is positive, anything down is negative. Now, if we have something moving, we can start talking about its speed. Speed is defined as your total distance traveled by the total time and is a scalar quantity. If I, let's go back to my videos. Um, <laughs> can't speak. I have this little call that has goes at a constant velocity. And if I turn on and go, I can talk about how fast it's going. I'll simply measure how, the distance it traveled from here to there and the time it took it to travel that distance. That will be the average speed. It is not instantaneous. This is not what your speedometer reads. That's just saying on average how fast it's moving. Speed will always be positive because it's a scalar quantity. This guy's moving to the left. It doesn't matter if he's moving to the left. It's still positive because we're talking about speed. And speed ignores any variation in the trip. If I go back to when I threw that ball up and down, um, so, whoop. oh, that's going down, not up. I can read. That says throw down. Uh, toss. Uh, the, the average speed, I would actually say, OK, how far does this travel? How far did it go up? How far did it go down? Goes about, I don't know, a half meter up for a total of a meter distance. How long does it take to go? It doesn't matter that it's slowing down on the way up and speeding up on the way down. It ignores that. Average speed totally ignores any variations. Total distance, total time, that's all that matters. Now, unit-wise, speed, we're going to take distance over time, distance in meters, time in seconds. And so speed will be measured in meters per second. But here's the thing. Physics-wise, speed is not very useful. It doesn't say things about the trip. And once again, it ignores variations. And if you want to try to solve equations with speed, it's going to become more complicated. That if I have to say the total distance something travels just versus its displacement, it becomes more complicated. And so instead of speed, we are going to use a different term. You see, there's a vector version of speed that's a little different, and that is called velocity. Where speed is distance over time, or average speed is distance over time, average velocity is displacement over time. And velocity is just going to be how much your displacement over the time. And this is a vector. If I wanted to find the average velocity of that car I had trudging to the left, I would have to say it has a negative average velocity because it's moving to the left. That you include direction in um, velocity. Good so far. Now, interesting thing with me throwing this ball up. I already said that the average displacement when I threw this ball up was zero. Well, not the average displacement. The displacement when I threw this ball up was zero because it started to end at the same spot. That means its average velocity is zero when I throw this ball up. And that's true. If it starts at the same spot, its average velocity is zero. That's because it has a positive velocity going up and a negative velocity going down that cancel each other out. That's OK. Now, the direction for velocity, or average velocity at least, will always be the same as the direction of the displacement, because time will always be positive. 
Um, sometimes I might ask for the magnitude of velocity. If I ask for the magnitude of velocity, just drop the sign. If it's positive, keep it positive. If it's negative, make it positive. Average magnitude of velocity is just what is on average. And this also will have units of meters per second. If you ever given something not meters per second, make sure you convert it. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, to get really the case of point of the difference between speed and velocity, let's say I have two cars, an orange car and a blue car. And they both go from point P to point Q in the same amount of time. What I can say is both cars have the same average velocity because both of them had the same displacement in the same time. But the blue car will have a larger average speed than the orange car because the blue car had a longer distance than the orange one. And so it battles whether we're talking about average velocity or average speed. They will be different for the two. Now, once again, we're mostly going to talk about velocity, because if I had to go and work out for speed for this blue car, I'd have to figure out exactly how far it moved on this curved path, where instead of just taking the two points and subtracting them, it actually will make things simpler. You note that we probably won't talk about speed much also because I even have symbols. That velocity, I don't think I said out loud, but velocity has a symbol of V. And average velocity, what we're talking about, is V sub av for average. I don't think I said that out loud before, but there you go. Instantaneous velocity, which is just V, we'll talk about on the next slide. But average velocity is displacement over time. Average speed is distance over time. Now, if you're driving in a car and you pass, you're going down the highway. You don't necessarily care how fast you're going on average. What's going to matter to you is exactly how fast you are mowing at the moment you pass that cop who's running radar right there. That's what's important, not what it is on average over the whole trip. Instantaneous velocity is going to be the limit of your average velocity for a very, 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 very small time value. Your instantaneous velocity is what is happening at every point in time. Now, of note, if you're moving at constant velocity, like my weird little car thing I keep showing, if your velocity isn't changing, your instantaneous velocity and your average velocity will be the same. Because if it's not changing, it's just going to be the same as on average. But that's not very likely. Most of the time, things are speeding up or slowing down. Um, this one? Nope, not that one. Da, 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 flat? Oh, this will work. That on this coat right now, I have something that measures change in velocity. I'll talk about more in a second. And as it hits the edge, you can see all those lights lit up and changed. That's a, a change in velocity it means your instantaneous and average will not be the same. And in fact, all the equations so far will for average speed and average velocity. Instant. Now, the nice thing is, is if your time map period goes to zero, what that also does is it basically makes the distance and the displacement turn into the same. And so therefore, the instantaneous speed is always the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity. And that if you know your instantaneous velocity, you also know your instantaneous speed. It's just speed is a magnitude, velocity is a scalar. Oh, sorry, velocity is a vector. I misspoke. Speed is a scalar, velocity is a vector. And so if I ask for instantaneous, which we don't have an equation for yet, I fully acknowledge that, um, you'll have to solve for it. Um, you have to make sure you include your direction. OK? OK. Um, I'm about to do our first real physics problem. Now, keep in mind, this is not a math class. Physical science, or physics in general, or chemistry when we get there, is trying to use math to explain the world. And so everything is going to be word problems, everything. And so I'm about to do our first actual word problem. So before I do a word problem, uh, I want to talk about solving problems in general as a quick aside. And then I'll go back to talking about this. 
if you're solving a mechanics problem, which is going to be everything we're doing the first four weeks of classes, um, you always want to follow the same steps. The next four weeks after this, you'll be able to skip the first step, and you'll see why in a second. But if you're solving one of these problems, this is what you should do. You should always draw the problem. Um, once again, this will come stop being a thing the, after the first four weeks of classes, but have a drawing will make your life easier. And what you should do is read the problem and get rid of all the words and collect just the variables, what you know and what you're looking for. And I recommend just listing them out by symbol. If I give you an average velocity, put a V average. If I give you a displacement, put a D. If I give you a time, put a T. And just list them all out. Once you have more listed out, make sure they're in SI units. If anything's not in meters, kilograms, or seconds, convert it. And then once you have everything listed out, you can lay out all the symbols in front of you and pull out all your equations and figure out which equations have the same symbols. And just pick out which equations have those symbols and rearrange and solve. That's how you're going to solve these problems. Now, once you're done, you should always make sure you answer the question. If I ask you for how long, how much time elapsed for something and you tell me 20 pounds, that makes no sense. Make sure it make, follows. Make sure it has the correct units. We're looking for a mass. Did you get kilograms? If you're looking for a time, did you get seconds? And make sure it makes physical sense. You know, if I'm saying, hey, you push this thing, how far does it travel? And you say like 20 times 10 to the eighth kilometers. I'd be like, that's really goddamn far. That makes no sense. Um, for solving word problems, there is a video that can help you do it. Here's a link to it right here. I'm not going to play it in class because I feel a little weird about playing other people's YouTube videos during my YouTube lectures. Um, that being said, I'm still going to do that anyway sometimes, but whatever. Um, but watch that on your own if you want. There's also a small talk I gave on how to solve word problems. But as I said, that was an aside. Let's talk about average velocity and solve a problem. Uh, any questions before I do that? No. OK. So here we go. The speed of light in space is known as c, where c is given as 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It gets its own symbol c, but it's a, it's a, it's the, it is going to be a speed. How many seconds does it take light from the sun to reach the Earth if the distance from the sun to the Earth is 1.5 times 10 to the 8th kilometers? So I'm going to draw my picture. I got the sun, they got the Earth, I got 1.5 times 10 to the 8th kilometers. And they're saying, how much time does it take? So I'm looking for time. Now, I said this was speed, but it moves at a constant speed. And I don't think I actually said that. Um, I'm going to add that. If it's a constant speed, what that means is that that's going to be the same as the average velocity. If it's moving at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second and not changing, that's my average velocity. Yes, I said speed, but I already said that instantaneous speed and instantaneous velocity was the same. And I also said instantaneous velocity is the same as average velocity. And so that can be my average velocity, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now, I'm saying it goes from the sun to the earth is 1.5 times 10 to the 8th kilometers. That's the displacement. That's how far between them. When I look at this number, I say 1.5 times 10 to the 8th kilometers. That's in kilometers. I don't want to work in kilometers. I want to work in meters. Well, I happen to know that one kilometer is 1,000 meters. So I'm going to convert this displacement. And I'm going to say my displacement is 1.5 times 10 to the 8th kilometers times a ratio, a ratio that cancels out kilometers to get meters. Oh, I was asked to slow down. Yes, I'm sorry. I will try to slow down. I am bad at being slow when I can't see people. And so the general idea is that velo average velocity was given. It's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Displacement is given 1.5 times 10 to the 8th kilometers. But we cannot work in kilometers. We need to work in meters. And that's why I'm going to do a unit conversion, just like we talked about last chapter. And I'm going to do a conversion factor like this because I want my kilometers to cancel. 
So I'm going to put kilometers on the bottom of this ratio and multiply by meters. Now, doing this math, 1.5 times 10 to the 8th times 1,000, that's 1.5 times 10 to the 11th. And therefore, my displacement is 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. And so um, now I know my displacement. I know my average velocity. And I didn't write it explicitly here, but I'm looking for time. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the equations we covered so far, which is pretty easy because we only really did one equation so far and figure out what matches. See, so far, all I've said is average velocity is displacement over time. And I can look. This is what I know. I know average velocity. I know displacement. I want time. And that's how I know this must be the right equation. And so I'm going to rearrange this. I'm solving for time. Right now, as this is written, it's not very good for solving for time. So I'm going to rearrange. What I'll do is I will multiply both sides by t. Anytime you're solving for something, if it's in the denominator, your first step should be to get it out of the denominator. If it's on the bottom of a fraction, bring it to the top of a fraction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by t. If I multiply both sides of the equation by t, I get that vt equals d because my t's cancel out on the right. Now, I want to get t. That means I want to get t alone. So I'm going to divide both sides by my average velocity. And if I divide both sides by my average velocity, I'll get that time is displacement over average velocity. And once I know that, I can plug in my numbers and do the math. Now, I kind of glossed over one small thing here. Or I didn't really gloss over, I explained it. But you'll note that I rearranged these equations without plugging in numbers. You're often going to need to rearrange equations. I'm going to tell you a set equation just like this, v equals displace d over t. But if I want you to solve for d or t, you're going to have to rearrange. I mentioned this last chapter. That's why algebra is a requirement for this class. Um, I recommend always rearrange without numbers put in. The reason why is if you rearrange it without numbers, you're less likely to make a mistake. Any questions on this problem? Yeah, so at the bottom, you got 1.5 times 10 to 11 divided by 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Why do you have 10 to the 8th? Didn't you only like solve for that? Well, that's what, this, that's what C was. That's just a number in scientific notation. The oh, velocity okay. is 3 times 10 to the 8th. Okay. okay. So I just left it in scientific notation. There's no need to go and you know, say it's three zero 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 zero. That's just a pain to write. So I'm just going to keep working in scientific notation. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Okay. So this was assuming constant velocity, but let's talk about what happens when your velocity starts changing. That. If I, let's go back to my videos. Um, and I'll just keep doing this one. When I throw this ball up and down, its velocity is obviously changing. That it leaves my hand at some weight, and it's going to be changing as it goes. That when the ball goes and leaves my hand, it's going to have some velocity. It's going to go to the highest point, where it's going traveling upwards, or the positive velocity, at its highest point, start falling. Going down, its velocity is negative. So its velocity is changing. Anytime you have a change in velocity, you have what is called acceleration. Acceleration does not necessarily mean speeding up. It is any time velocity is changing in either direction, if it's speeding up or speeding down. Something slowing down is still acceleration in physics terms. And so anytime your acceleration is changing, either the magnitude of acceleration or the direction of acceleration, and we're going to come back to that point later on. Um, sorry, I think I misspoke there. Let me try that again. Anytime your velocity is changing, either the magnitude of velocity or the direction of velocity, I don't think that's what I said, you have acceleration. And acceleration is just change in velocity over change in time. 
your V final minus V initial over T. You'll sometimes see me use this delta notation, just a triangle. Delta means change in. And so we'll just say final velocity minus initial velocity over time. That is your average acceleration. Um, on one of the videos I showed before with the cult, <laughs> projectile cult, no, uh, flat. I don't think I have ramp in this one. It should have ramp in this one. Where's that video? Here it is. I was missing a video. But when this coach on a ramp, it's going to have some acceleration. We'll talk about that in a second. This little guy on the top here, it's an accelerometer. Its lights are going to show up showing acceleration. That anytime something has acceleration, positive or negative, it will show it. Positive acceleration to the right will be green lights. Negative acceleration to the left will be red lights. When this was flat, not counting the moment I push it or when it hits the end, the lights basically aren't lighting up. You get a little bit of red with an acceleration in the negative direction. That's because friction is slowing it down a little bit. But for the most part, there's no acceleration until it hits. However, if I have this on a ramp, when I push and let go, you can see the entire time it's moving, it has acceleration in the negative direction. That at all times, it's accelerating down the ramp, except when I push it. See, when I push it, I'm giving acceleration to go up. But on its way up the ramp, it has acceleration down the ramp. On its way down the ramp, it has acceleration down the ramp. That's just saying how the velocity is changing. Now, we are going to measure acceleration, average or instantaneous, in meters per second squared. This is because velocity is meters per second, and we're going to divide meters per second by seconds, getting those units. Also note, acceleration is a vector. If the acceleration was up the ramp, like the green light showing, like as I push it, like here, up the ramp, that's up in the positive direction. But once I let go, and you can see it's the second I let go, it switches down. That if it's down the ramp, that's going to be a negative acceleration for the entire time it's moving, or it's accelerating in that way, until I give it a positive acceleration again by catching it. So if your velocity is constant and you don't change direction, you have no acceleration because your V final and V initial is the same. That's showing this guy flat, that what, except when I push him and it hits the edge when it's moving, it doesn't show acceleration. That's still playing. If instead you have a change in velocity, the acceleration will be different depending on what's going on. And let's see if I can make all of this fit at once. OK. If your acceleration velocity are in opposite directions, that means you're slowing down. That when this coat is going, when this coat's going up the ramp in this region here, it's going up the ramp. It has positive velocity. Its acceleration is down the ramp. It has negative acceleration. If they're in opposite directions, you are slowing down, like in the picture I have above. And that actually will be in general. Anytime velocity and acceleration are in the same direction, you will speed up. If they're both positive, if velocity is positive, acceleration is positive, you're going faster in the positive direction. If your acceleration is negative and your velocity is negative, you're going faster in the negative direction. That'll be like when this is coming back down the ramp, that my velocity is negative and my acceleration is negative. So it's speeding up down the ramp. But if they're ever in opposite directions, your velocity is positive, your acceleration is negative, or your acceleration is negative, your velocity is positive, that will mean you're slowing down because it will be decreasing your velocity. OK? Now, this was all for average acceleration. But here's the nice thing. We're only going to talk about a non-changing acceleration. We will never talk about what happens when your acceleration is changing. And if your acceleration isn't changing, that means the average value and the instantaneous value is the same. 
And so we will only talk about an instantaneous acceleration being the same as our average acceleration. Um, if your acceleration is changing, that is called a joke, because like you joke to a stop. Um, you can see that the, that only happens, the change in acceleration only happens while I'm pushing, uh, while I'm pushing this, it's hitting the edge or I'm catching it when it's actually moving. It's constant and not changing until I catch it. Um, so we're only going to deal with constant acceleration. That means since average acceleration is final velocity minus initial velocity over time, that means if acceleration is constant, instantaneous velocity is final velocity minus initial velocity over time. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the left hand side of this equation, just kind of ignore this and say, OK, if I take this equation, I can multiply both sides by T. If I multiply both sides by T, I get AT is V final minus V initial. I would then go and add V initial to both sides. And what this says is you can always find your, your instantaneous velocity if you know your initial instantaneous velocity and your acceleration in time. That your velocity as a function of time is going to be how fast you were going initially plus acceleration times time. V final equals V initial plus AT. Questions? OK, I'm going to do another example problem. Let's say you are driving at 30 meters per second. And you see a red light. When you see the red light, you slam on the brakes. By slamming on the brakes, your car has an acceleration of negative 6 meters per second squared. How long does it take the car to stop? OK, let's look at what we know. So I want to draw, I'm going to go through my process I said before. I'm going to start drawing a picture. And so here is my picture. I got a car that's moving, and now I have a car that's stopped. Only the fanciest pictures for you guys. Let's look at what we know. I know I have a car that is driving at 30 meters per second, and then it wants to go to stop. That means initially the car is moving at 30 meters per second. That's its initial. I say the car has an acceleration of negative 6 meters per second squared. That means it has an acceleration of negative 6 meters per second squared. Um, I know one other thing. Let's see if one of you guys are willing to speak up. What else do I know? What's my final velocity? How about that? Your final velocity would be zero. My final velocity is zero because I'm looking for how long to stop. That means my final velocity is zero because stopped means not moving. Not moving means you have no velocity. And so I'm going to say we start at 30 meters per second. We have an acceleration of negative 6 meters per second squared and a final velocity of zero. Where I want to know how long it takes to stop, aka how much time passes. This picture is really what I'm solving. These words up here is what I started with, but that's not going to that's going to be complicated compared to what we're doing. I'm just going to take what's written on the bottom here and that's what I'll solve. Now I should make sure that everything is in SI units, but it is meters per second, meters per second squared. We're good. And this is what I'll solve. Now I got to match an equation. And I have a few equations now. I have V equals D over T. But I didn't mention D at all in this, so that's not likely. But I did just have an equation with VI, VF, A, and T. I just introduced V final equals V initial plus AT. And I can say, OK, let's see. V final equals, oops, sorry, I messed up. V final equals V initial plus A, and I'm looking for T. This has exactly what I'm looking for. So that must be the equation. And so I can solve it. Now I'm looking for t, so I'm going to try to get t alone. I'll subtract v initial from both sides. And then I can divide both sides by my acceleration. 
and there is my equation for time. That my time will be v final minus v initial over a. V final was zero. V initial was 30 meters per second. Acceleration was negative six meters per second squared. And so I have zero minus 30 is negative 30. Negative 30 divided by negative six, that's five. It takes you five seconds. Any questions there? Okay. Let's talk about a special case. See, I can have acceleration for anything. This car slamming on the brakes, that's acceleration. But let's talk about instead what I've been doing videos of and me throwing a ball up and down. What happens when something is in the air? If something is in the air, it's going to get affected by gravity. Right? Acceleration on Earth is always downward due to gravity. That if you're up in the air, you're going to go wee and accelerate down. Any time you are on Earth, you will there will be an acceleration that if you're off the, if you're standing on the ground, there's no acceleration because you're standing on the ground. But if you're not on the ground, there will be a force trying to pull you down, causing an acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared. 9.81 meters per second squared is known as G, just the acceleration due to gravity. Now, of note, this G value, it's given as a positive value. But if you are falling downwards, down is in the negative direction. And so anytime you're in what is called free fall, free fall means something is falling. It's not like it doesn't have a rocket attached to it to go. It's not like a plane that there's other forces keeping aloft. But if there's just something in the air allow, not being acted on by anything else, in free fall, you always accelerate downwards at a rate of g, g being 9.81 meters per second squared. But since acceleration is a vector and acceleration is downward here, I have to say that if you're in the air, your acceleration will have a value of negative g. This is important. I'm going to stress this right now. Your acceleration is negative 9.81. G is positive 9.81. Anytime I have an equation, I'm going to assume g is positive 9.81 meters per second squared. But in most equations, we're going to plug in a negative g. We're going to need negative g. Any equation with a g in it, that negative has already shown up. But g equals 9.81 meters per second squared. Your acceleration is negative g, or negative 9.81 meters per second, second squared. And anything falling with nothing else acting on it will be in this free fall. We'll be falling at this rate of negative 9.81 meters per second squared. OK? Now, this seems kind of weird. If I take this ball and drop it, it falls pretty fast. If I take this piece of paper and drop it, it kind of down, right? And I'm saying everything accelerates downwards at negative 9.81 meters per second squared. And this leads to the question of, well, what should fall fast, a feather or a hammer, if you have no air resistance? And see, here's the idea. We know on Earth this isn't always necessarily true. That when we drop something, and sorry, I forgot to open this link ahead of time. When we drop something, we'll find that different things will fall at different speeds. The reason for this is because of air resistance. That when something, um, when something falls, the rate at which it falls will be affected by what it hits in the air, the air molecules. But if you're in a vacuum, if there is zero air resistance, everything accelerates downwards at 9.81 meters per second squared. So this video I'm about to do was filmed in the largest vacuum chamber in the world, in Ohio. And the general idea is they took this huge ass room and sucked all the air out. So there was no air in it at all. It's still on Earth though, so there's still gravity. And they simultaneously dropped a bowling ball and feathers. <coughs> now, the video is in slow motion, so it's going to look like it falls slowly. Okay, but when we simultaneously two, drop both these things. One, release. 
When we simultaneously drop both these things, they fall together. And this has also been, the first time this was actually tested was on the moon. Someone dropped a feather and a hammer at the same time. That with zero air resistance, everything accelerates downwards at 9.81 meters per second squared. Everything. It doesn't matter what it is. How heavy something is, no effect. How, what shape it is, no effect. Everything, once again, assuming no air resistance, falls at 9.81 meters per second squared. Any questions, though? Uh, yes, isn't the G supposed to be negative if it's falling? Nope, that's what I said. G is a positive number. Your acceleration... Okay. Uh, I went too far. Your acceleration is a negative G. But G itself is a positive number. Got it. Okay. Yeah, all right. Now, let's say we take something and we do drop it from rest, uh, this set of videos, that normally I would be th like doing all these things in the room, but you know, we're not in a room, so I have to do videos. But let's say I just take a ball. ball. Oh, here's me actually showing it. This is what I thought it was. This is me. Um, so in this video, let me jump ahead, you can see it. I have a metal ball bearing and a ping pong ball. Okay. And I'm going to do it with that. Now, they both will have approximately the same air resistance. Uh, because if we're not in a vacuum, this is just me doing it. But they have basically the same air resistance. And I can try to do this idea. Drop a metal, a ping pong ball and a metal ball. You can see the same idea. They fall together. That they both accelerate down to the same rate. They both have an acceleration of negative G, or negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Because it doesn't matter how heavy they are. And keep in mind, that metal ball weighs a lot more than the ping pong ball. It doesn't matter. Now, if you drop an object from rest, like in that video, because that's all I'm doing is I'm dropping two things from rest, you can say exactly how much distance it travels as a function of time, or aka its displacement. Now, really, I should be better with negative signs here. Because if you drop something, its displacement is down and is negative. And G should be negative. So really, there should be a negative sign here. And this D will always be a negative value. But normally, when you drop something, you kind of know it's going to go downwards. And so you just say, how far did it drop? If you ever want to find the distance something falls or the displacement downward a thing moves, the displacement down would be given as one half GT squared if it starts at rest. And sorry, I switched notations here and I'd never noticed. Oh, I fixed it on the next slide. Um, there's a mistake here because I'm switching between two different classes with two different notations. That I'm not talking about what happens if I throw the ball. I'm saying just if it drops. I'm not saying what happens if um, I throw something downward like this. That's a whole other can of worms. I'm not saying what happens if I throw something upwards like this. That's a whole other can of worms. If it starts at rest and drops, the displacement downwards, how far it drops, will be negative one half GT squared. Once again, assuming down. And we can say how far something would drop anytime it's in free fall. Using this, we could also say we had this equation earlier, v final equals v initial plus at. We can also find the velocity of something moving when it was dropped. Because all we're going to say if something's just dropped, v initial is zero. And the acceleration is negative g. And so if we drop something, we'll say the velocity will be negative gt. And that anytime you drop something, you can find out exactly if you know the amount of time it was in the air, you know exactly how far it went and also how fast it's moving. OK. Any questions, though? OK. 
Um, that is 1250. So I'm going to stop there because that's all the time I have today. Uh, we'll pick up next time with an example problem about this. Okay. Okay. Have a good day. Have a good day.